Here we are back in the studios of Whistle FM in the heart of downtown Stouffville. We're talking with computer security expert Claudio Popa this morning. Claudio, privacy. We've talked a little bit about what happens, you know, when you go into social media and it asks you about the privacy and chances are you should read it. But the thing is, most people don't. For whatever reason, whether they find it overwhelming, pages and pages and pages of that little tiny type, whether they feel like you have to be a lawyer in order to understand it, and whether there's a bit of that, what I call, lemming mentality. You know, the one guy throws himself off the cliff so everybody else goes along after him. It seems like people get outraged when something untowards happens. But for the most part, they seem okay with sharing every single aspect of their lives, the fact that they're on vacation, where they are, how long they're going to be, (laughs) so that their house is obviously left empty. (laughs) Here, come rob me now. (laughs) You know, these kinds of things that people might necessarily not think are important. So why why are social media platforms collecting this? information do you think other than just advertising is it purely just for advertising purposes well i think they're definitely taking advantage of that simple fact everyone knows that people don't read privacy policies in terms of service and if they did read them they would be unintelligible anyway and so there's an opportunistic uh, approach to this which is bordering on the unethical and most mm-hmm. people don't realize that there are two ways for them to give consent to a company to collect and use their personal information. And one is explicit com- consent, and the other one is implied consent. Mm-hmm. So implied consent has been used and abused for decades uh, now to the point where every mature privacy legislation is changing. So that model is changing because we've we've observed and and time and time again studies show that people will not change no matter what you do people are not going to read these privacy policies and why should they they can't they can't understand them because they're written to not be understood they're designed specifically to not be understood so uh laws around the world are changing to require express consent which changes everything it means you suddenly have to spell out what it is you want in plain English or whatever the local language is. And it means that the human being has to physically put a check mark in a box, therefore saying, yes, I wish to share this information with this party. And the implication there is only with that party, which again is a huge implication, especially in the Loblaws uh, situation that we've seen in the past couple of weeks, where Loblaws went ahead and, and shared that information with some other companies outside of Canada, El Salvador, etc., um, just because of this implied consent. And so, uh, so there absolutely needs to be more pressure on legislation to demand uh, express consent from people because it uh, will protect individuals. There will be a lot less uh, fluctuation, even from an economic perspective. You will have so much less fluctuation on stock markets just because people are outraged that they, in fact, gave, gave consent without knowing it. Because when each person knows what it is they're signing for, well, that adds up to millions of people or billions of people. And those billions of people know exactly what has happened and that uh, and that outrage, that backlash will not happen. And, of course, it, it stabilizes things on any number of levels. So things like that scale massively. It's a good thing for those kinds of laws to be adopted. But if they're adopted in one country and not in another, what does that do? That is an imbalance, and it matters which country uh, organizations uh, are part of. But the fact is, each country can impose their laws on um, on these data collection companies. So I've, I've taken to calling them data collection companies because that's what they do. So, for example, Google is a much bigger uh, uh, organization than Facebook is, especially from the use of personal information mm-hmm. in th- selling you as the product to advertisers. And of course, uh, we've seen a lot of judgments coming out of Europe, uh, fining and applying various, uh, fines to Google 
over the use of this personal information and the right to forget and uh, and and so on the right to be forgotten mm-hmm. etc so people do need to be in control of their own uh personal information when it comes to um social media or otherwise yeah the or otherwise is getting really big now with things Huge. like um the Google Home and what's the Alexa one that was another Mm-hmm. home device. That's right. And people are getting caught up in the technology of how cool it is. I mean, I heard somebody say, yeah, all I do is say good morning to this thing, and it tells me what I'm doing today, and it tells me the weather, where I am and where I'm going, and how long it's going to take me to get to work. And I said, think of all the information that that thing has to have in order to give you that information. And are you good with sharing that? <laughs> it's, it's addictive. Uh, I think it's as simple as that. I mean, it's addictive and we're not evolutionarily pre- prepared for this, for this kind of thing. It actually sounds like it cares about you. Yes. Uh, much like those creepy Barbie dolls that now talk, but they're cloud connected. And so they ask you questions, not necessarily Barbie, but other dolls yeah. that ask you questions or ask your child questions. And suddenly your child's voice is recorded and sent to some uh, data center somewhere in the United States and analyzed for preferences, which supposedly serves to create better toys. Uh, but in fact, uh, <laughs> all that background noise and all of your uh, children's uh, uh, discussions are saved. And to the point where, and again, this is tangentially, um, uh, tangentially very broad, but Police forces around the world have said, well, since you're collecting that information anyway, we need access to that doll, uh, those, those conversations that are recording, uh, recorded through dolls in order for us to identify situations where children might be abused in their own homes or they might be trying to report abuse to the doll because that's the only thing that they might be trusting in the house. So there's all sorts of interesting Offshoots of the Internet of Things and the and the cultural changes that that it brings about in a hurry. Wow, that is scary. Mm -hmm. That's really scary, especially because conversations, as we know, through broken telephone or just you know hearing something versus seeing something, seeing something and not hearing it. All of these things contribute to miscommunications in a huge way. So somebody just sitting down and listening to realms and realms and realms of information that could be so misconstrued. And then all of a sudden you've got all these police officers at your door trying to take your kids away. That's right. That's a scary scenario. Uh Have you ever seen Black Mirror? Uh, it's a TV show. Yeah. Um, I think I tried, but I, I didn't make it too far no. into it. Is it one of your well, favorites? Well, there's different episodes. Mm-hmm. And one of my kids is really freaked out by them. And I think what freaks her out is the fact that it's so possible. It's so on the edge of this actually could happen mm-hmm. now that it's frightening. Because I don't think... I think it's easier for a lot of people to not sign the Privacy Act because then they don't have to read it. And then they don't have to know exactly what they're signing. You mean the tri- privacy policy? Privacy policies, mm-hmm. yeah. And the the conditions upon accepting something. Or even, I'm sure, these little devices, Google Home or whatever, come with big manuals that nobody ever reads. They're probably still in the box. Actually, over from it came with no manual at all. Really? Which was very bizarre because I had to, or we had to figure out what it is that we can talk to this thing about. And suddenly we're, we're playing charades with it and it's organizing games with the family. And it's, the only thing it needs to know is how many players. Yes, we play uh, trivia with ours all the time. Right. Right. It's, it's actually really fun. So it absolutely but it's kind is. of and scary. It never forgets. It learns everything from yes. you. Um, I like it, it when she says, I w- I'm sorry, I can't help you with that at mm-hmm. this moment, but I'm learning that's every right. day. If that's, if that's <laughs> not <laughs> ominous, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. Mm-hmm. I mean, she is pretty funny. I actually said, okay, Google, good night. And she said, um, I'm seeing wood. Yes, I hope you sleep like a log. <laughs> okay, thanks, Google. Good night. That's right. <laughs> it's really weird. It's, I mean, uh, I can see the really good things about it. There are good things for people who are shut in or seniors who don't have their family around as much as they could. You're actually talking to something that talks back. It's a nice thing. It makes your house feel like there's someone home. But I'm just a little skeptical. 
of how much information to give this thing. It's intelligent. So that intelligence is growing. It's a neural network. Um, it's learning from everyone at the same time. So Tesla cars, for mm-hmm. example, they've got hundreds of millions of miles mm-hmm. logged literally learning from how people drive. And every time someone buys a Tesla, that car is watching the way you drive. And all that information goes back to Tesla. And Tesla learns how people drive. And it's been going on for many years. Wow. Uh, it was somewhere in your documentation. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I don't own one, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's, right. that's really weird. So there's a lot that you are agreeing to when you buy that kind of a car. It's actually a, a computer on wheels. And it's learning from everything because it's planning to drive you around in the future. And it needs to be able to anticipate absolutely Everything. And it cannot learn just from you. It has to learn from the tens of millions of people driving at the same time. That's very valuable information. So that reframes the discussion, and you suddenly realize that's not necessarily a car manufacturer. It could be anything. They could be making anything. It's actually a data collection company. And so the analysis of that uh, data is what gives this tool intelligence, just the same way that those uh, SpaceX rockets land on their feet each and every time. They learned time after time from each of their predecessors uh, to, to adjust themselves and to land properly. That's done with data. And data leads to information if you analyze it. And if you understand it, that's called knowledge. It's it's almost unfathomable. I mean, you know, to sit here and think, okay, well, why is Google collecting all of this stuff? Well, artificial intelligence is going to be the way of the future. But I'm still trying to grasp a fax machine. You know how you type in something here and it ends up over there? It's to to the brain that's not brand new. I think it's a really hard thing to grasp, the vastness of this whole information gathering. We don't have a choice. So that's the one thing you need to adapt to. It's an information society. It has changed us culturally. And you need to understand that your key asset is not your house or your car. It's your information. And so you're made up of of a lot of information. You're, you're a, a database of information, a data warehouse of information, <laughs> much of which is uh, secret. And so preserving the secrecy of that information... Well, you have the right to privacy. That is the right to preserve the secrecy of the information that you're holding. How do you do that? While we're on the topic of of definitions, you do that using security safeguards. And I'm mentioning this because a lot of people don't know the difference between security and privacy. And, of course, secrecy and confidentiality and things of that nature. So, um, So keep that in mind. Privacy is a right, but the underlying how... The, the answer to the question, how is it that we enforce privacy? Well, we do that with security controls, and we can, we can yeah, certainly well, talk about yep. that after the break. After the break. Thanks a lot. You're listening to Fresh Waves on Whistle FM. We'll be back with Claudio Popa right after this. Hey, everyone. This is Lil J. Join me every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern for The Block Party a two-hour journey of the best in the Canadian underground dance music scene, featuring tracks and DJ mixes from Canada's emerging artists, from the disco hits of the 70s to the latest dance floor fillers. No lineups or cover charges, it's your weekly free access to the beats that are packing dance floors in Canada and around the world. The Block Party, Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on 102.9 Whistle FM, and online at whistleradio.ca. We're back on Fresh Waves. We're talking with Claudio Popa. So how do we do it? How do we get some modicum of privacy? How do we implement some security on our systems? How do, how do we do it? So that uh, that's another difference between privacy and security. You either have privacy or you don't, but you can have different degrees of security. And by the way, security is different from safety. Safety is your 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 ability to keep safe from harm. Um but security can be a feeling, it can be a perception, mm-hmm. but it's also the cumulative outcome of applying 
layers of safeguards. And those safeguards are called controls in, in my world. Those controls can be anything from passwords, which we're used to punching in, uh, to encryption, uh, which scrambles your data so that if and when it's stolen, it will mean nothing to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, all the way to little programs, which I'm recommending the use of. In this particular case, uh, when you surf the web, for example, and you're looking, let's say, for a game of solitaire, uh, you Google solitaire and the word free, and you can pretty much expect that any site that you visit will have some kind of advertising on it or tracking because free means they have to get their money somehow. Yeah. But some of these are a lot more aggressive than others. So when you go to some of those uh, websites, a tiny piece of code can get injected into your computer or into your browser automatically. And that could be malicious code or it's just tracking code to identify your 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 preferences and figure out whether to serve you ads about white shirts or or medical supplements. Um, so in the case of malicious websites, which, by the way, represent upwards of 70 percent of infections to. Uh, people's personal computers. In those cases, those are called watering hole attacks. So people will spread um, search engine optimized uh, pages across any number of search engines, and likely you're going to get there because you're looking for something that you want for free. Maybe a free ebook, maybe a free game of solitaire. So you get there, and that's a watering hole attack. That watering hole attack. Uh, happens as it, as the, even before you even see the page. So the page identifies what browser you're connecting with. It prepares a little piece of code that will only run in your browser and you won't see a thing. It'll just inject it into your browser. And from that point on, it'll, it'll either track you and what you do online or even more ominously start to record your keystrokes or watch your screen or any number of hmm. types of, of infection. So uh, to prevent some of that stuff, you need to look into browser add-ons or plugins or extensions, as they're sometimes called, depending on which browser you use, whether you're using the Microsoft, the Google, or the uh, Mozilla one. Okay, so a plugin, is that kind of like spyware and all those different things that protect you against viruses? Is it the same sort of thing? Yeah, it's a little piece of code. So, so we think of each browser as a platform. So Microsoft and uh, Google have created their browser as a platform to allow developers to augment its functionality. So um, a lot of the cloud-based applications that you use are literally just web browsers, and they have different buttons that you might see. And, you know, right to the point where a browser might be unrecognizable and you think it's some cool interface, it's actually just a web browser. If you go to, uh, let's say, a website called EFF.org, uh, you can go and download a little add-on called Privacy Badger. And Privacy Badger sits there and watches for trackers. So trackers are websites that in, do just that. They track you. And Privacy Badger catches the tracking code and absorbs it without allowing it to run on your computer. And this little Privacy Badger is a tiny icon at the top right of your browser screen. It's a free tool. It's um, created by the Electronic Freedom Foundation. And uh, and it, it's one of the trusted add-ons. Hmm. Um, and it'll run on pretty much any platform. So that's one of my recommended uh, tools. Uh, another one is Adblock Plus, uh, ABP. And it uh, it blocks ads. And, of course, a lot of infections do come through ads. So it's not about us circumventing the business model of the web or the Internet. Mm -hmm. It's also about protecting our browsers and our computers. It's, it's come to the point where no one should be browsing without add-ons. 
So web browsers cannot be trusted to safely allow you to browse the Internet. You will be tracked. You will uh, get infected with something that you will you have not given consent to. And that's wrong because beyond that point, you can no longer trust your computer. So if you trust it to do your web banking, but you've gone and, and searched for games previously, well, uh, that computer might not be... Uh, Trusted. A lot of right. people just assume that if they're infected, it's obvious. It's going to be obvious. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Twenty years ago, as soon as you got infected, there was a little snake that crawled across your screen <laughs> and a worm, and it was very neat. And your screen did some sort of a neat animation. Uh, today's infections are all financially motivated. Therefore, it helps them make a lot more money mm-hmm. by remaining covert. And hiding, right. uh, hiding from antivirus tools. Interesting. So someone said to me recently, and they actually sent me a a question for you while you were here. They believe that they've been hacked. Their bank information, everything was compromised. It was quite a big mess. Blah blah blah. And they thought that it was because of Facebook Messenger. But from what I'm hearing right now, it could have been anything. You don't really know what it was. Well, um, instant messaging exploits, as we call them, were invented even before the days of ICQ, which most of us don't even remember. But uh, uh, AOL um, and ICQ were around a long time ago. And suddenly, uh, malicious individuals started sending links to drive people to websites that were infected. In effect, uh, maximizing the impact of this watering hole attack by simply spraying these infected links across any number of messengers. And so because Facebook Messenger is so popular and people are by default logged in, by the way, um, hmm. I usually recommend that you click on the little options wheel and make sure that you're offline um, on Facebook Messenger so it's some random person doesn't just... Uh, see that you're online and and send you a message or a link, which you could be clicking on it by accident, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, any Anyone can send those infected links and drive you off of Facebook and onto a website that will push some kind of an injection into your computer. As far as injections are concerned, or as far as um, infections are concerned, um there are uh, there are tens of thousands of new strains of viruses in- introduced into uh online each and every day so each and every minute there are thousands in fact uh so no one no one actually releases viruses without actually testing them against the top antivirus tools so mm. That's why it's important for people to realize that their antivirus will not individually, will not by itself save them from infection. It takes a combined approach between different controls, between different layers of safeguards to protect themselves. So you can't just say, well, I have a firewall and I have an antivirus. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There are viruses that are specifically designed to be undetectable to uh, to the antivirus that you have. And it doesn't matter whether you paid for your antivirus or whether you're using a freebie. Hmm. That doesn't sound very encouraging. <laughs> it, it allows you to be accountable for what you do on your computer. Uh, it's not rocket science to protect yourself. If you're on the web, then you use privacy and security add-ons on your web browser. Hmm. If you're literally using any program, then obviously you can rely on your Windows firewall, you can rely on your antivirus, and today's antiviruses include anti-spyware, anti-malware of different kinds, so there's different flavors of Trojan and so on that you don't need to worry about, uh, but which are, in fact, detectable if they're given enough time. So... um so that's another concept. So the concept of a zero day means the day that a virus is released, no antivirus can detect it. But tomorrow, 
antivirus uh, tools will be updated because everyone's antivirus goes every day and downloads its its new virus definitions. Well, if you give it a day, then it will work to protect you. And how do you give it a day? Well, you have these other controls in in place. And those other controls can be anything from uh, automatic patches that your computer should already be deploying and and installing uh, all the way to um, to um, to email spam filters so a lot of of the emails uh, email tools that we're using these days gmail for example has built-in spam filtering and it's great mm-hmm. uh, simply because it learns from every one of the hundreds of millions of people that are using that platform. Right. Um, it's learning what spam looks like uh, all the way to Outlook. Uh, and Outlook has, again, built-in Bayesian filters that will recognize spam. And in so doing, they may give your antivirus time to update itself. Right. That's why mm. it's, it's, it's important to update as often as you can. But it's a distributed approach. It doesn't serve any purpose to have two or three antivirus uh, tools. But if you've got these diverse security tools, then you have that layered approach. And it's not again, it's not rocket science, you just need to install some of the tools that that people are trusting. And you can tell what they are because they have more stars. So if you go to the add on section of your Mozilla or plugins, uh, they'll tell you this tool is more trusted than others. ABP and Adblock Plus, for example, is the most trusted um, anti-advertising uh, 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 tool out there. So hmm. install that one. And certainly the Privacy Badger is a good one. Ghostery is another one. Ghostery, Ghostery? <laughs> uh, is another good one that will run on Microsoft browsers if Privacy Badger doesn't. Um so yeah, there's uh, there's a number of really straightforward uh, ways that you can protect yourself, uh, but there's also myriads of ways that you can infect yourself just by virtue of assuming that once you crack open a box for a new computer, you can just connect it to the internet and wow, look at that! I've I'm on the internet within five minutes of receiving this. Mm-hmm. Well, within six minutes, you'll be infected. So <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> Whether that's much of an achievement. <laughs> well, it sounds like a. there are some safeguards that people can use, and I guess common sense? Is not so common? It's not so common anymore, mm. is it? It seems like there are people out there who are trying to be more clever than common sense. And even if you exercise common sense, I mean, short of turning off Facebook, all social media, all internet browsing, that's the only way of being completely private and safe. It's easy but to it's blame it on, on apathy, but I, 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 we're lucky that we live in Canada where we can put pressure on companies that want to do business. In order for companies to do businesses in Canada, they need to respect uh, the privacy of Canadians. And we have the right to question their practices. We can question them directly or we can question them through the privacy commissioner by initiating an investigation. So this is great that we have mm-hmm. these tools at our disposal for experts to act on our behalf and protect us and our information assets. It seems like it'd be a good business to start a, a social media business that just helps people set up their social media to put on little privacy things, to ask them the pertinent questions that they may not be asking themselves. You know, okay, do you want this information shared? No? Okay, well, let's press this button. (laughs) If people care that much. Mm -hmm. As long as they don't pay for it using pop-ups. Yes. I, I actually ordered something online. I must say, I'm, I'm not an online shopper, but recently I have ordered something online and I am absolutely beyond myself amazed at the advertising that I am now getting on a constant basis. Do you want another one? Oh, how about this brand? Oh, have you ever looked at this brand? Oh, well, now that you bought that, do you want to see this? It's like, Gah! how do people who shop online all the time handle all of this advertising that all of a sudden is everywhere I look? Or maybe That's I'm just noticing it. Well, uh, so just a quick tip uh, along those lines. Try to stick with with one or two trusted places that you shop from. Don't don't necessarily buy from random vendors. And also try to use one payment method 
like PayPal, for example. Yes. PayPal is a huge organization that you know where you're putting your credit card. You mm-hmm. know it's going into PayPal, and they're doing all this anti-fraud and and various other uh, types of uh, analytics. Uh, but if you go to a random website and you put in your credit card into that site, then you suddenly have to make a mental note that your card has been used on that site and you should, in fact, scrutinize, uh, as always, you should scrutinize your, Where you've been. your credit card uh, statements. Uh, but yes, try to stick with trusted vendors and stick with, with large credit card processing uh, companies like the PayPal's of the world or right. Square or what have you, uh, as opposed to, you know, going off the beaten path and expecting to uh, expecting those companies to have invested that heavily on or, or in security and in the privacy of your your data. They simply don't have the same the resources, the resources. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Claudio, we've run out of time. Hmm. We could have you on this show for four hours, and we'd still have stuff to talk about. This is just such a broad topic of conversation now. It is, yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. And we hope My that pleasure. we can have you on again sometime and give us some more tips and information. Absolutely. There's a lot to be talked about. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. 